Hi guys, my name is Phil and welcome to Phil Does 3D. I'm a multimedia and 3D artist and I stream on Twitch weekdays from 5pm Pacific Time in the US, 12pm in Australia and 1am in the UK. Hope all you guys are well and you had a good weekend. Good to see you Sniper Echo, hi and hi Galen, how are you as well? I, I had a good weekend, yes. Um, I had to catch up on some work for the studio, so I had a pretty busy weekend. Not much rest time, unfortunately. Such is life, I guess. Um, oh, you had to redo some work, Galen. That's no good. Remember, guys, I tell you, make sure you save regularly. Like, Galen's a pro. I'm sure he knows that, but for all you other guys, make sure you save regularly and save incrementally, like I told you. That way, even if you do a save and your file corrupts, you can always go back to the previous version. Anyway, I hope you guys are well. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, I hope you guys can find me with Twitch's new, what are they calling it now? Communities feature. They did away with categories and creative and now they're doing communities and there's no 3D modeling community set up. So I don't know what Twitch are doing at the moment. Um, I'm still streaming with my regular hashtag. So hopefully you guys can find me. Uh, obviously Galen and Sniper Echo have, so that's good. Um, if you are looking for me under the categories tab though, at the moment I'm streaming under our art station. Just until Twitch either create a 3D modeling community or do something with the 3D artist section of their creative website. I don't know what they're doing at the moment. I know it's a beta feature, but they really shouldn't have remo removed categories without um, setting up a community for 3D modeling. That's just my opinion. Anyway, enough about Twitch. Um, so let's bring everybody up to speed on what we've been doing over the course of our streams. We have been, we created our 3D model in 3D Studio Max. We textured it up in uh, Mari by the Foundry. So, and then we exported our model from Max and brought it into uh, Eon View. To set up our, our 3D environment. Oh, okay. Galen says that uh, he didn't lose a lot of modeling work, just lighting work and quick renders. Yeah, I'm sure you saved, Galen. I, I, <laughs> this is more for the benefit of anyone else that may be new to uh, design or 3D and just to remind everybody that they must save regularly. It's, it's really important. I used to find when I was doing university and a lot of the guys um, would lose their assignments because they either would forget to save or their uh, file would corrupt. And if you save incrementally, you don't have that problem. So that's just my advice for people watching. Uh, Galen says he saved, but then after the crash, he did a recovery and saved over the last save and didn't check the file before saving, and the recovery was older than the last save. Uh, yeah, again, with uh, with um, saving incrementally, you guys have seen me. I, I have my file name, for instance, Garden Terrace, and then I put R for revision 1, uh, and then R2, R3, and that way I can easily see what my last, um, the latest version of my file is. It'll be the one that's the highest R number. I just found that really helps me with my workflow. But I'm glad you didn't lose too much work, Alan. I'm glad you're here watching and I'm glad you're here too, Sniper Echo. Thank you. And all you guys that are watching, if you, <laughs> hopefully you found my channel. <laughs> yeah, it is rough. Sniper Echo. Still, I'm sure Galen can catch up on what he's lost. Yeah. Do save regularly, guys. Do save incrementally. Um, it's just a good habit to get into. As you guys know, I turn off um, automatic saves in my program because I don't like it interrupting my workflow. It tends to sort of freeze the program while it does an automatic save and I don't like that. So, But if you turn that function off, you always must make sure that you do save regularly, manually. Uh, Galen says he usually increments as well saves, so as much as if you have to undo something. Well, that's very true as well. Make, that's a very good point actually, Galen, mate. Uh, Saving incrementally will not only help you if a file becomes corrupted but with your last save to be able to jump back just to the previous version, uh, but it also helps if you actually do something in the 3D program or the paint program or whatever program you're using. It, it, it applies to anything you do with regards to a computer. Um, you can undo something that you, maybe you've done that you didn't like and sometimes with the undo feature that a lot of programs have, but they only let you go back so many steps. And after that, you can't undo it. So having an incremental save 
uh, every time you make a major change, which is what I end up, what, what I do, if you decide you don't like that major change and the undo function won't let you undo all the way past that change, you just load up the previous version of the file. So that's a very good point. Now, we've finished setting up our, um, our environment here for our garden terrace. I want to talk about the background. Now, I've been explaining to you guys, there are a couple of options you, had in, you have in view here for your background. You can by all means create uh, a mountain range or create a forest with trees using views built in features here of mountains and uh, ecosystems. That's perfectly valid and that's what view is created for. Um, I don't tend to do that, particularly with these sort of renders where I do pretty focused shots on a model. So I'm not rendering a huge environment, I'm, I'm doing sort of more focused shots and, and this trick that I'm going to talk about will really only work for these more focused shots. Because if you have a large environment you really can't put an artificial background in. Uh, so instead of actually creating a background of trees and mountains, I'm going to use an image. Now an image will give you a couple of advantages. Um, it will speed up your render time quite considerably. Um, it'll create uh, a more interesting and visually nice looking image, generally, than, than creating an environment in view. Um, and it's also going to save on a computer memory on your computer. Uh, Sniper Echo says, I wonder if there's a Blender incremental autosave feature. Yeah, I don't know. And Galen says, there is an autosave function, but it's not very good. I, Max has one, but I, like I said, I turn it off, so I don't like the autosave feature on any program. I turn it off in View as well. But View, as I've been explaining to you guys, has the advantage of um, if it does crash, it tries to do a backup for you anyway, automatically. And as you saw on my last stream last week, when we added our trees here in the foreground, our hero trees, View did crash, but it created a backup, which, and we could continue working from where we were, and we lost no work. So. Yeah, Sniper Echo says he doesn't use it himself, but caused some issues in the past. Yeah, like I said, my main issue with an autosave feature, it's a good thing to have, particularly if you're not used to saving regularly. So if you forget to save your work regularly, don't turn it off. I don't like it because it freezes the software momentarily while it saves, and that can interrupt my workflow. I really don't like that. Uh, so I turn, turn it off on any software I use, whether that's... Um, 3D Studio Max or Eon View or anything like that. That's just my personal preference. Again though guys, like I said, if you don't, if you don't remember to save often, don't, you probably shouldn't be turning it off. Uh, but do turn it off if you find it gets in the way when you're working. Uh, Sniper Echo says, I think this is the community for 3D modeling Well, You can create a community that starts with a number. No, 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 Nightbot won't ban you, Sniper Echo, or Galen, or any of my regulars. I've um, I've gone through Nightbot's settings, and I've made sure that uh, you got you regular guys can post links, you can post symbols, because I know that uh, Smurfery Barbecue likes to post symbols. Uh, uh, Nightbot won't ban you. It's only going to ban people, and remember guys, like I said, uh, feel free to pop into chat. I love to look at your work. But if you do post a link and want to post a link in chat, and you're not one of the regulars that are on my channel here, Make sure you tell me in chat first before you post the link, otherwise Nightbot will ban you. Or time you out anyway, at least. Um, you must let me know first so I can uh, add you as a regular so that Nightbot lets you post links. So uh, you regulars, you're good to go. You won't be banned by Nightbot. You won't, um, you can post your links, you can post your symbols, do all that good stuff. Just new guys that aren't on my regular list that do want to pop in and show me some of their work. And like I said, I love looking at your work, guys. That's why I'm on Twitch. I'm here to help you as much as I can and to show you my work as I'm working on it, uh, to look at your work as well though. So if you do want to show me some work, feel free, but do remember if you're not a regular to tell me in chat before you post the link, okay? Um, I'll have to check that uh, that um, link out you posted Sniper Echo about the community for 3D. Because I just know that if you go to Twitch and you go to the creative section and then you go to uh, communities, the communities tab, with all the little squares that show all the different communities, the graphics, there is none there for 3D modeling. So I don't know what's going on. And Galen says he likes the idea of communities, but it's made an absolute mess of the creating creative streams. I agree. 
I think the idea behind communities is great and I'm all for Twitch uh, updating, you know, Twitch itself and, and adding new features and functions. That's a great thing. I just wish they'd sort it out a bit better for creative streamers because we don't tend to, it's not like gaming where you play one game and so you know what your community will be. For instance, my stream guys, I'm a 3D artist and a multimedia artist. So just for this project that we've been working on now, I've used, uh, you know, 3D modeling in 3D Studio Max. I'm doing rendering in Eon View and creating environments. Then I'm going to be jumping into Photoshop and doing color correction. So I wish Twitch would explain to me which community they want me to, to uh, stream in. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of crossover with creative streams. You can't really be locked it's just into one category like you can when you're playing a game. Uh, and Dr. Echo says, uh, Yeah, no, my stream will always be streamed under the creative section because I'm a creative streamer and I don't play games generally on stream. Um, but just the communities within the creative section is a bit confusing at the moment. That's all. And Sniper Echo says um, there's only 17 streams listed under creative, I'm assuming he's saying. Yeah, it's... I know it's, it's in beta, so, you know, Twitch are working on it, and I'm sure they'll improve it. Like, they've improved the um, video section, you know, where you upload your videos to Twitch. Not not your VODs, your past broadcasts, but you can actually upload videos to Twitch, which I do with my streams. At the end of each day, I break my stream up into three different videos, and I upload it to my Twitch page. So, under the videos section, I have videos that will that stay stored forever. They don't uh, get deleted after 14 days like the VODs usually do. Yeah, I thought you I thought you agreed, Sniper Echo. That's cool. I know what you meant. And like I said, though, with the communities, I think it's a great idea that Twitch are trying to improve the service. Um, it's just, it's creating a lot of confusion for creative streamers. So I really want Twitch to either come out with a statement for creative streamers as to exactly what they're planning to do. At, at the very least, add a 3D modeling community uh, under the communities tab on the creative section, Twitch. Come on. <laughs> It's not just me that does 3D modeling. A lot of guys do a 3D modeling and stream on Twitch. So I'm really surprised that uh, that category seems to be missing. That community, community seems to be missing now. Anyway, let's stop talking about Twitch for a little while. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are here. I'm glad you guys found the channel. I hope this doesn't uh, prevent other people from finding my stream. We'll find out, I guess. Uh, so we were talking about backgrounds here and, and, and using an image as opposed to uh, setting the scene up in view. Yeah, I know, I know anyone can create a community, Galen. Uh, that's true. That's why Twitch, Twitch created them so that anybody can, can create their own. Uh, something as uh, encompassing as 3D modeling, Twitch should be creating that community. It shouldn't be have it shouldn't the responsibility for a general category like 3D modeling shouldn't be the responsibility of a streamer, it should be the responsibility of Twitch. <laughs> we did touch on a hot button. Anyway guys, enough, enough. I don't want Twitch to be angry at me. I'm sure they'll fix it. It is in beta. Let's see how it pans out. Talking about our backgrounds now. Uh, I'm gonna use a background image, like I explained to you guys. I am still streaming, they haven't cut me off, good. <laughs> like I explained to you guys, it's going to speed up your rendering. Um, now a lot of people might think, well, if you're going to use an image as your background, why don't you do that in Photoshop? Because a lot of people tend to work that way. They'll render out their image, then they'll put their background in, in Photoshop. Now, because we're working with such intricate and detailed geometry, now remember this scene you're looking at here, down in the corner. We are now at nearly 3 billion polygons, so that's uh, 3,000 million polygons. There's a lot of polygon detail going on in that scene. Um, to create a proper alpha map to, to cover, say, all of these small twigs and fine leaves, to be able to put a background in convincingly in Photoshop is going to be a nightmare. So that's one reason. Uh, the second reason is we want to create more than one camera here. We're, we're going to create this, we're going to do a render of this scene, which is our pull back shot, wide shot of the model. But I'm going to be creating four more close up cameras of different parts of that model. Um, and if you're just trying to put a background in in Photoshop, 
to be able to get a convincing um, continuity between this background scene in this one and then when we start moving our camera around it's going to be really difficult if you're just using a, a flat image that you're putting behind in Photoshop. So let, let's talk about creating this background for our scene in, in view. Now to do that I'm just going to jump quickly into photo, into Mac and explain how I do it. It's, it's pretty simple, it's not nothing complicated. You create your plane um, in my case, I'm going to increase the number of uh, width segments here. Generally, I'll work at about 24. Now, just before we sh I start talking about this, let me jump into the image I'm going to use as the background. It might be easier. Now, I found this image that I like, but I didn't like the colors in it. So I did color correction on that image and, I and I, I'm going to be using this image as my background. Again, you know we have our God rays coming through because I'm going to be putting God rays in the main scene. Um, I wanted more green and less of the orange in, in, in my scene to suit my scene. So I just did some color correction in Photoshop. This is the image we'll be using as our background. We're not going to see any of the um, path at all because the model is going to be covering that up. Uh, an important consideration though when you are thinking about what image you want to put in your background is to make sure that the um, the view that the photograph has been taken at matches the view that you're going to be using for your camera in your view scene. So, so don't um, use a photograph where you're looking at head height in the camera for your render, but the photograph's been taken either from an aerial height or from right down on the ground looking up at too much of a steep angle. It's not going to match up. So if you're going to use an image as your background, make sure that the um, field of view and the angle, the height that the photo has been taken at matches somewhat your camera height. It doesn't have to be exact, but, but somewhat. You can see here that obviously the person that took this photograph is, is, has taken it standing up. It's uh, like head height, which is the height our camera is at. And most photographs will be head height because that's a natural way to take a photo. Um, another thing to try and to avoid is um, let me uh, find some of these background images here. So I want to show you an example of something that would not be good to use as a background image. Right, one of these. Um, let me just enlarge these a bit more. So something that would be bad to use for your background image would be... Um, I want to give you an example of one that's really quite obvious. Probably one like uh, this. You see the trees are too far forward. You could get away with it if provided you pulled right in. But uh, anything in the fog, try and avoid any photographs for your background that have a lot in the fog or anything in the foreground, like this tree in the foreground, that's not a good background image. This would not probably be a good background image because of this foreground um, flowers. If you place uh, geometry above that line, then you could use this as your background image. But generally try and avoid anything in the foreground if you want to use a background image. And again, if you look at our um, chosen image here, you see that there's really nothing in the foreground. And that's why it makes a good background picture. So we choose our background image, we find out an image that we like. Once we've found our image, we find our dimensions of that photograph. And in this case, that photograph is 3000 pixels by 1700 pixels. And that's another thing, try and go for as high a uh, resolution of photograph as you can find because it'll make a clearer background image. So don't don't use a 640 by 480. Nothing too small. Make it quite. Make sure you get a quite a, a high pixel uh, background image. And 3000 by 1700 will work for us. So in your 3D program, I suggest you make a plane and you make the dimensions of the plane uh, to match the background image. So 1700 in our case by 3000. So you've got your plane to the dimensions of the photograph, whatever that is for the photograph you're using. Um, I, again, I've added 24 width segments because 
I want to put a bend modifier on this. Now, whatever 3D program you're using, I'm sure you can bend your mesh in some way, shape or form. Uh, in Max, it's just called the bend modifier. So throw a bend modifier on it. You want to go in the Y direction and for the angle, you want it to be um, negative 90. Oh, not the Y direction, sorry. The X direction. And you want to make sure your bend is uh, minus 90 and that's just to give you this curve. So again, you see it's just a, a 90 degree curve to the plane. So you, you would apply your um, texture to that uh, plane and then you would export this plane as an FBX or an OBJ or whatever takes your fancy to bring it into Eon View. So that's just a, the procedure for setting up your background image. 90 degree angle on a plane and the plane dimensions to match the uh, photograph dimensions. Okay. I'm not going to export this because I've already done that, so I'm going to close Max down. Okay. I prepared one ahead of time for you guys. Just close that down as well. Okay, now I've brought in my background that I just showed you. I made it the exact same way that I just showed you in Max. And I've just, uh, all I did was go file, import object, and imported that uh, plane from Max. Now, I'm going to pull back here so you can get an idea where that plane is. It's, um, if I select it, you see it there. And you see how far I've pulled it back from the model. It's, it's relatively close. You um, align that in your main camera viewport here. You sort of position it looking through your camera viewport as to where exactly you think it would look best. Now, one thing I do want to point out when you do use a background image, and I'll pull back here on my model, you see how large that image is compared to our model? I'll just deselect it for a minute. Now you might be thinking, why is the plane, why is it so big compared to, you know, the size of our model here? Won't that, um, won't you lose all of that? Because when you look through your camera, you're only going to see that tiny bit there. Well, that's not the case. Because you're looking through a camera, the camera is going to take into account, because of that field of view, most of that image. Now I positioned this looking through my main camera here, and I can tell you, even though that image looks really large in comparison to our model, it's going to render up completely fine. We're going to see all this detail all the way up to nearly to the top and right out to the edges. So using a background image plane in view, don't be concerned if um, the background looks too big for whatever it is you're rendering out because that's natural, normal, and uh, and that's because of the camera and the field of view. Trust me, uh, you will see it all. It, it will look wrong in your viewport, but when you start doing your renders in your camera, it will be correct. So, I just wanted to point those few things out to you guys about using a background image. Don't be worried that it looks too big in your viewport. It will be fine in your uh, camera viewport. Don't pull the background image too far back behind whatever it is you're rendering and position your uh, your plane as far as, you know, uh, the X direction here goes by looking through your camera view here. And in our case, we're looking through our main camera view. Uh, that, that'll get a good position for us for our other four camera, close-up cameras as well. Now, the reason we did a curve to the, uh, to the background image as opposed to having just a straight plane, the straight plane will look fine doing a render through our main camera here. But if you want to pull into your model or angle your camera around, you're going to have a problem. It's the same problem you get if you just try to put a background image straight into Photoshop. Um, you're going to angle your camera and look this way and you're going to see the edge of the uh, plane and the plane is not going to look right. It's going to look like it's on an angle compared to where the camera is. But by putting a slight curve to the uh, background image, no matter where you position your camera, you're going to get a nice coverage of, uh, of that background image. And also by putting a curve to the background image. And when you do move your camera to different angles of the model, you're going to start to see different parts of that background image. So it's going to look more natural. It's going to actually look like a proper background and not like a picture you've stuck behind the scene. Okay, so again, if you're just rendering one camera, which is that in this case our main camera here, you could probably get away with a plane. Um, I would still probably do a curve because it will look more natural in the render. Uh, you could get away with a plane, but trust me, do a curve. Get, get into the habit of doing a curved background. 
And again, like I said, that's really going to help you when you start moving your cameras around to take different uh, angled shots of your model or your environment. Having that curve will stop, um, will, will, will look more natural as opposed to having a flat, um, a flat plane. So just having that bit of a curve, the camera will pick up more of the image and pick up different parts of the image as you move your camera around. Again, it'll look more natural and look more real. Most of the time people won't know that you've used a background image and uh, the final render will look uh, more realistic as well. And it will speed up your render, so it's a win-win-win. If When you can, if you can, use a background image. It'll speed up your renders, the renders will look better. Um, it's, it's just better all, all, all around. And again, though, you can really only get away with that if you're if you're focusing on a small part of a um, landscape like we are. If you're creating a really large landscape with mountains and all that type of thing, you probably can't use a background image. So it just really depends on the scene you're trying to render out or create. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Galen says uh, he sometimes uses a one-quarter sphere as a background. Yep. Animation so that the different camera angles never catch the edge of the background. Yep, that's another very valid way to do it as well. Particularly for an animation. Um, like, um, I'm not sure if Unreal still do it, but in the olden days, or, uh, you know, a few years, five years ago, skyboxes used to be very big. And that um, fly-through of that Art Deco that we're going to be tackling next in Unreal, I used a skybox in that, which is a cube, which is mapped to um, to the sky. So it's a similar sort of thing. And you could do the same sort of thing in um, view if you wanted to. Probably not necessary if you, unless you're really flying through the scene and going to be turning the camera back. If you're, really, if you're only going to be ever focusing on the front direction, just using a, uh, a curved plane is easier to work with uh, than, than using a sphere. It's easier to actually create your image as well. Uh, if you're using a sphere, it can be a bit more difficult to... You either need to, to use a proper um, panoramic image to begin with, or well, you have to create one and make sure that uh, it blends where the two edges meet. But it, it certainly, for animations, like Alan says, it's a very valid way to do it. A quarter sphere is, is a valid way to do it as well. Or a half sphere, like I said. A half sphere, you probably need to use a proper image. But that's another valid way to, to do a background, by putting a half sphere over your entire environment. That way you can turn your camera 180 degrees, 360 degrees. Um, View can actually create those for you as well. I haven't touched on it well, through this project because we haven't used it, but uh, View can actually create a 360 degree render of your uh, of your environment and you can use that in your game engine as well. So yeah, I, I won't be showing you that for this project because again we don't need it, but do, you can render out um, 360 degree panoramas from view and then use those in a a, in a a sky sphere or a half sphere in your game engine if you wanted to. Again, view, a lot of guys that use view do that for games as well. So don't think games, uh, don't think view is only good for these high, you know, for doing rendering, high resolution rendering. It's, it, it can be useful in games as well because you can, you can render out your environment 360 degrees so you can create a, a sky sphere in your game engine or a skybox. Um, you can export the terrains that you create, create in view as height maps to bring them into uh, engines like Unreal and create your uh, terrains that way as well by doing the sculpting in view and rendering out a height map. So you can be a pretty versatile program depending on what the project is you want to, you're working on. Yeah, HDR, it's great for backgrounds. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Galen says, not just uh, global environmental lighting. No, that's right. A lot of people think a HDR image you use to, to make sure that your lighting is correct or realistic when you're doing a render. But it's much more useful than that because you can do these 360 degree um, environments or whatever it is you're creating, whether it's a game engine or a, uh, a rendering, an animated rendering. But again, remember guys, View can, can, can render out these 360 degree camera uh, sky boxes for you and you can also use it to uh, export height maps for use in, in real-time game engines. Um, anyway, let's get back to what we were doing here with our project. So this is my plan of action for today. I've created um, four more close-up cameras. So when we do our color correction in Photoshop for this project, the Garden Terrace project, 
we're going to have five renders we're going to be working with to do color correction on. We're going to have this main pullback render that you see down here in the viewport and four more close-up renders of the model. Um, I wanted to do close-ups of the model because, as you guys know, we put so much work into creating the model and texturing it up in Mari. Uh, we really can't get a proper look at the texturing from this uh, distance because we're pulled back so far from the model. So I wanted to create four more close-up cameras of different sections of the uh, terrace so that we could see a bit more detail and see the model in a... a see a bit more of the detail in the model and the textures so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be uh, rendering out those four five camera images now I did some tests over the weekend to make sure to prepare for the stream to make sure we weren't going to be wasting too much time now I'm not going to be rendering this main image out because I know that this main image is going to take about a half an hour now let me just jump into my render settings here for a minute and talk this through up until now, you've seen me rendering preview quality. Now, preview quality is really good to set your scenes up really quickly and uh, get fast feedback on what your environment looks like. So when you're setting everything up before you have everything finished, always work in preview quality. And that's what you've seen me um, using so far. So we imported our model, set up our materials, then we started creating our environment here, gradually adding bits by bit until we came to our final image here, which is our finished um, scene setup in preview quality. Now again, preview quality, very low quality. What we're going to be doing today is rendering out in what View calls final quality. Now that's View's definition of final quality, not mine. Um, final quality will give you a relatively fast render and, be able to, and you'll be able to see in more detail what the scene is going to look like. Um, I generally will not ever use that for my final render. My final render, I will always go into what they call broadcast quality. Um, and the, the disadvantage of going to broadcast quality is you're going to roughly double your render time. So if your render takes uh, half an hour in, in final quality, it's going to take about an hour in uh, broadcast quality. Don't ever go to what they call superior quality unless you really want to wait, you know, five hours for a render. And you're not going to get much better an image than past broadcast anyway. Uh, all the rendering, the final renders I do are in broadcast quality. I'm going to be rendering out the five cameras, the four cameras today in uh, what they call final quality, but I would never, never settle on final quality. I don't, I'm going to re-render them after the stream in broadcast quality, so when we come back tomorrow and we jump into Photoshop to do the color correction, we'll be we'll be working with uh, broadcast quality renders. But I wanted you guys to see the renders as they were happening today on stream live. So I'm going to be using uh, final quality. I just want to make those distinctions. By all means, if you're happy with um, with the render you get using final quality, then use it. Uh, I'm not. Uh, you, you're going to get a, a nicer image using broadcast quality. Don't ever go to superior quality because it, it really does add nothing to the image and it just slows the render down dramatically. So again, just to recap, if you're working with View and you're setting your scenes up, always use preview quality until you get everything laid out the way you like. Once you've got everything laid out the way you like, you can do final quality renders to give you a better idea of what the scene looks like. Um, my suggestion though then is not to stick to final quality renders, but to go to broadcast quality renders. For your final, final image that you want to save on your hard drive or put in your portfolio. Uh, always do a broadcast generally. It will double the render time, but it will look much nicer, much clearer, much cleaner. Uh, but that's, and again though, that's your personal preference and your personal choice. If you're happy with final quality, then by all means use final quality. My recommendation though is to, is to do it in broadcast quality. Now, um, let's, let's uh, talk about creating more cameras because at the moment we've only been using this uh, main camera view which is pulled out on our model. To create a new camera in view, it's really quite simple. You just um, select a camera, you want to copy the camera, and then you want to paste the camera. And that's going to create a copy of your main camera in the 
exactly the same position as the one that you're looking through. Once you've done that, you can select the copy it made and move it around in your scene to get an angle that you really like, that you want to do a render on. Now again, I've already done that, so I'm prepared for you guys and I've created four more cameras for our scene here on different close-up parts of the model. And they're the ones we're going to be rendering out now. In order to change your camera view here in the main camera viewport, you want to select your camera, main camera. Now hopefully you can see it. Uh, you can just see it above my, um, my music there. There's a little drop down menu just here in the corner that says main camera. If you click that, you won't be able to see it because it's going to be hidden behind my, um, behind my overlay. But, but it, it will list the second copy of the camera you just made if you, if you just created a, another camera. I've already created them, so it's going to list all of my close-up cameras because I've already uh, copied and pasted and moved them around. So to change your camera, you select your main camera, you hit that little drop-down down here, and select the next camera that you want to render out. In my case, I'm going to jump to camera 3, close-up camera 3. And you see that uh, your viewport here will change to the new camera and the new camera is pulled right in close to the model here as you can see in the top viewport okay uh, remember guys if you've got any questions anything you're not sure about or you don't understand uh, please feel free to pop into chat and ask me um, if you just want to pop in and say hello that's cool if you just want to watch that's completely fine so it's, it's really easy though you just to move a camera, you go into your move tool here and just move it around. Go to your rotate tool and rotate your camera to the angle that you want. It's the same in most 3D programs, so nothing new really there. Uh, just selecting your camera is, is a little different in view and that you select the camera, you go to this little drop down menu down here and select the camera that way. And that will update your main camera viewport here. All right, so we have our our close-up camera one, well, in this case number three, one of our close-up cameras selected. Let's do a render on this and let's not do it in that preview quality you're all used to. Let's do it in final quality so we can get a better idea of what the uh, render is going to look like. Now, it's going to be slower than doing it in preview quality, but faster than doing it in broadcast quality. Uh, I don't want to do broadcast on stream because it, it's going to take a little, you know, I don't want you staring for an hour at something rendering out. And this will render out in about 10 minutes or so, so for each camera. So we're going to change our, our post render quality to final. We're not going to change anything else. Um, so that's the only change I've made to my render settings. I'm just changing it from preview quality to final quality, okay? We've selected our close up camera, so let's do a render. Uh, what it's going to be doing, you're going to look at a black screen at the moment because it's doing what they call a pre-pass. So it's working out, this is a radiosity engine of you, uh, throwing um, rays through the scene to work out exactly that calculation. You won't see anything because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not actually rendering, it's just doing its calculation work for radiosity at the moment. Uh, but it should get through that pretty quickly and once it does that then it will start rendering out and it will render from the top across so if you saw in our preview quality it's sort of um it's sort of what's the word uh, it, it it improved the image gradually bit by bit so it still ran down the screen but you saw something completely and then it went over the screen again and again and, and gradually kept refining that image it's going to not going to work that way this time it's going to actually start rendering the image properly and it's going to go line by line from the top all the way down to the bottom so it's not going to gradually be improving the image, it's going to render out the proper image to begin with. I know with some of you guys have used V-Ray, it, it works a similar way to our preview quality in that it, it throws out uh, a rough ray render first and then it starts uh, improving that bit by bit over the image. View works differently and it does it line by line. Progressive Refine is what, is what blend, well thank you Galen, it's probably what it is called Progressive Refine, yeah, and that's a good Thank you for popping in and telling me. Yes, progressive refine is right. V-Ray works the same sort of way when it does a render, it progressively refines it. 
Our view does not work that way. Not that you see anyway. Behind the scenes, it's working the same sort of way, but when it starts actually rendering out, it's its, it's, its final render quality. But it does it from the top and works line by line all the way to the bottom. I know when I do a render in V-Ray, it tends to jump in a circle around from the, usually from the middle to the edges. Uh, view again doesn't work that way. It does line by line by line, but final quality line by line by line. And like I said, what it's doing, I don't know if you can read it on the screen there, but it says pre-pass and it's just working out its radiosity at the moment, the calculation for radiosity. It should get through that pretty quickly and then it will start the actual proper render of the um, image. What, I'm, what, I'm, what my plan for action here for the stream is going to be, I've created my four close-up cameras. I'm going to... Like I said, you guys have been very patient that have been watching me stream while we've been creating the garden terrace and texturing the garden terrace and watching me create the environment in preview quality renders. I'm sure you're very keen to see what the actual thing is going to look like now in final, you know, in a higher resolution render. And that's what you're going to be seeing today. I'm going to be rendering out the four close-up cameras in the high, high in views final quality render quality. I'm not going to do the main image, but I'll show you one that I've pre-rendered at the end of the stream so that you know what we're going to be doing tomorrow. The only reason I'm not going to render out the main image here is because um, it takes about an hour, even at final quality. And I'm going to, and uh, I don't want you to wait for an hour looking at a screen render. So. But I do have it ready and I will show you at the end of the stream what, the, uh, what our main scene looks like, our pullback scene. But today you're going to be seeing renders of the um, of the four close-up cameras. Final quality renders of the four close-up cameras. Again, views final quality, not my final quality. Because I'll be re-rendering them after the stream in broadcast quality. So tomorrow, when we jump into Photoshop to do color correction, we'll be working with broadcast quality renders. Uh, now, again, you see, hopefully you can see, it's going to be quite dark, the render at this stage as view renders it out because after it does its render then it's going to do a light pass on it which will brighten it up so as you see it render out here you're going to see the final image look quite dark once view gets to the very end of the render to the bottom of the image it's going to do a light pass and that will lighten everything up i wanted to start with this image for you too galen because this image uses god rays now i'm using god rays in our scene because that background image you saw me using has God rays in it. And in order to match that as, as closely as I can, I wanted to put God rays in our uh, garden terrace scene. And it will suit the image as well because we have uh, angel statues, God rays. Like I said the other day, it's a bit cliche, but it'll work. It'll work well. And this close up um, render here that I'm doing has a lot of God rays in it. And I wanted to show you guys how you just how um, useful doing renders in view can be because you have the option of changing the lighting after the fact. So with a lot of rendering programs, when you render out your image, that's it. You can't really alter it unless you jump into Photoshop and do it that way. Well, view is a bit different. It, it has um, interactive uh, lighting. So you can actually change your lighting after the fact, after the image is rendered. And I want to show you that after the start after this render finishes. 